tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 3 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Hey, Heartlanders, you guys patrons yet? Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to join the club. You'll get ad-free versions of this and all our other podcasts, including hundreds of standalone releases from our audio archives dating back to 2012. It's a great way to show your support, and you get a whole lot for it. Well, Heartlanders, quick sidebar. We here at the Fear from the Heartland show and the entire Chilling Tales for Dark Nights team are excited for the changes that 2023 will bring. We'd like to present one of those changes to you tonight. It's a brand new year, and we have brand new merchandise for everyone. My beautiful wife, Nikki, overhauled our selection of Fear from the Heartland goodies that you can take with you anywhere. Shop and explore from over 70 products, all featuring the brand new Fear from the Heartland logo design, including stickers, pins, mugs, clothing, and so much more. To check it out, just click the New Year New Merch link in the description. Your 68 Camaro won't start said a wife to her husband as he awakened with a hangover after a night out with the boys. I think there's water in the carburetor. How do you know? said the husband scornfully. You don't even know what the carburetor is. I'm telling you, repeated the wife. I'm sure there's water in the carburetor. We'll see, mocked the husband. Let me check it out. Where's the car? in the swimming pool. Breakfast that morning was scorn pops. Three creepy tales tonight where female entities had been done wrong. They come from talented author Dan Weatherer. Let's get after it. Why do some treat the living so horribly? If we knew what awaits us after those treated as such were to come back and exact revenge, the adage, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, is unabashedly prevalent in three tales tonight taken from The Haunted Isle, The Black Lake, The Interment of the Safe, and The Screaming Skull by Dan Weatherer. The Black Lake Leek, Staffordshire, November 1871. It was during the dying embers of summer that I first received correspondence from a land developer by the name of Leopold Thack. Since my last investigation at the dressmaker's shop, I had spent many hours locked in my study with an assortment of books with the intention of broadening my knowledge of British history and folklore. The article I had penned regarding the dressmaker's mannequin had afforded me a certain degree of local fame, and my letterbox had been flooded with an array of missives detailing all manner of strange occurrences. Most, I believed, to be the work of hoaxers, and I paid their pleas little attention. 
However, the letter sent to me from Mr. Thack alerted my curiosity. I must hasten to add that the promise of a substantial payment upon completion of my investigation convinced me further that now was the time to place my studies aside. After all, one can learn so much more from experience than from books alone. Mr. Thack wrote that he had been charged with the renovation of Blakemere House and her grounds by Mr. Joshua Strandfold and that part of his remit included the draining of Blakemere Pool. Herein lay the problem. If it suited, Thack would meet with me and further outline the issues at hand in person. He went on to explain that such a delicate and significant matter deserved to be discussed man to man, for he feared that a detailed written account would be all too easily dismissed as a hoax. I replied stating that I would be interested in meeting and Thack arrived on my doorstep the following week. Over tea, we discussed at length the issues that had plagued the renovation of Blakemere House before our attentions turned towards the lake. I must begin by insisting I'm not in the slightest bit mad, said Thack, placing his empty cup to one side. The sea holds many secrets, I believe far more than we can possibly imagine. He paused, his skin flushed red. Tell me, sir, have you ever heard of a creature called a mermaid? I replied that I had read little on the subject, but knew that the creature was a concoction of Greek and Assyrian myth. Thack nodded in agreement. I have heard the tales also. Tales I thought were all they were, but... He paused again, seemingly unsure of his next words. He leaned towards me and lowered his voice. There is something in the water of that lake. I've not seen it, but I've heard it. I asked as to what he thought he had heard. I'm not going to venture the answer that you think, save to say it was big. Very big. I suggested that could have heard the movement of a large fish, or perhaps that of a duck or goose. To jump to the conclusion that I assumed he was angling towards after the earlier mention of a mermaid seemed ludicrous to me. He was not to be convinced. I'll stay with fact, for you shall think me insane. Better you hear the tale from Mr. Strandfold himself, should you so choose. However, I will say that there are no fish in Blakemere. The pool is murky with peat and clay, the water thick and black. It is no place in which life may thrive. Indeed, no animal will drink from the pool, not any of the cattle that graze on the moors and no bird above it. This I have seen. I urged him to continue, fascinated by this revelation. The existence of a body of water which animals feared, if fact described it truly, was worthy of investigation itself. Yet I knew there was to be more to this tale. Its depth is unfathomable, continued Thack. My workers before the... He paused and took a moment to gather his poise before proceeding. My workers set about draining the pool. They dug a deep furrow to the south and began to pump the water by hand. Day and night they worked and the level did not alter, not even by an inch. You must understand... The efforts of their labors would have drained any other pool by at least several feet. They continued to work to no avail until... until the sightings began. They said it was a mermaid. He paused, produced a map from the inside of his jacket and pointed first to the location of Blakemere Pool, then to another nearby. Here, this is Doxley Pool. Finding natural lakes at this altitude is unusual. Both of these lie 1,500 feet above sea level. Some say that a subterranean chamber connects the two, hence the water level in Blakemere refusing to dip despite our efforts. It's one theory, one we cannot disprove anyway. I regarded the map for a moment. The lakes were situated in Staffordshire. A knot formed in my gut. Was I ready to return to the county where I had almost lost my life? Mr. Strandfold has offered to accommodate you for as long as needs be. He will explain the sightings in more detail should you choose to take us up on our offer, said Thack as he folded the map and placed it back inside his jacket. 
He is a determined sort, and he will not let superstition bar the way of what he deems progress. His mind is set on clearing his lands, and the lake is to go. Whether you believe my words or not is irrelevant. Mr. Strandfold and I would like you to thoroughly investigate the area surrounding the lake so that we may continue with our endeavors. We have a frightened workforce who refuse to go anywhere near the lake. We shall not interfere with your methods and shall afford you as long as deemed necessary. You shall be well compensated for your time. I told Mr. Thack that I would indeed consider the offer and that I would be in touch. The idea of a mythical creature inhabiting an inland lake high up in the remote moorlands of Staffordshire intrigued me as did the prospect of discovering the origins of the tale. Still, the possibility of a hoax remained high. Could it be that the plans made by Strandfold had irked the locals so much that they had created the story of the mermaid in a bid to persuade him to leave the lake as it was? Could it be that I was the target of a hoax, having made somewhat of a name for myself locally? Could this be an elaborate ploy, set up to make me appear foolish? All were possible, but there was something in Thack's tone that told me he believed there to be something in the lake. He presented as a man afraid, afraid and unsure of what he was faced with. If this was a hoax, then Thack was an unwitting accomplice. The story fascinated me and I wrote the next morning to confirm my interest. A date to meet was hastily arranged and a carriage was sent. I stepped aboard not having the slightest inclination of what to expect with regard to this particular investigation. Would I be unearthing the threads of fabrication woven in a bid to dissuade the wishes of an unwelcome landlord, or would I reveal the existence of a creature previously believed to be the subject of myth? Though I remained apprehensive for the bulk of the journey, the knowledge that I would be paid in any eventuality soothed my sense of uncertainty. I arrived at Blakemere House late into the night. Though the moon appeared hidden by cloud, what little light it offered afforded me a decent view of the property. The entire west wing of the house was missing a roof. Timber long exposed to the elements outlined a skeletal shape, giving an indication as to how the house once had stood. The vast majority of the walls had crumbled, beaten upon by the relentless gales that afflicted the moors. Blakemere House stood in ruin. Mr. Thack met me at the foot of the driveway and escorted me into the inner sanctum of the house. He informed me that only the kitchen, study, master, and guest bedrooms were habitable, but assured me of a restful night nonetheless. Strenfold was sat at his desk when I entered the study. He did not rise to meet my hand, merely nodding to a vacant seat situated to his left. I took it, introduced myself, and waited. Neither of us spoke until Thack returned with two bowls of stew, a plate of bread, and two tankards of ale. Taking the lead from my host, I began to eat. It was Strandfold who spoke first. Thack says you don't believe in the mermaid. I dabbed my mouth with a handkerchief and explained that it was not so much a case of not accepting the merits of the tale outright, more that I intended to find proof of her existence before offering an opinion on the story. Strandfold began to laugh. He was an old and portly man. Thin wisps of gray hair streaked his round face. Tiny eyes glistened with tears as he coughed and choked on his bread. My boy, you shall find your proof. Of that I am certain. He placed his bowl of stew under the lip of his desk and stood. Come with me, he said, beckoning me to follow. He led me to a large window that looked out onto the moors. Blake Mirror Pool lay to the right several hundred yards from the house. The smooth surface of the water glinted in the moonlight, offering an almost mirror-like surface, one which reflected the night sky in perfect symmetry. Many times I have stood here and watched her swim, began Strandfold, a hint of nostalgia in his voice. Of course, she never shows herself fully. I only ever catch the ripples of her movement, or, on occasion, the sound of her leaping from the water. She is in there. You shall see. For a moment, the two of us observed the lake in silence. Not once was its surface disturbed. Strandfold clapped a quick hand on my back. Come, eat, 
Let me tell you the tale of how she came to these parts. Though I do hope that you are of a healthy disposition, for mine is not a happy story to tell. I assured Strandfold that he need not fear and took my seat beside his desk. He patted his round thighs and smiled. Course, I don't expect you to believe a word of it. I didn't when I bought the place. Put it down to superstition. Those down there in town don't care for me much. I figured it was a story meant to scare me back up north. Strandfold went on to tell me how he had acquired the property at auction the summer before last. It was his wish to restore Blakemere House to its former standing, and he assured me that it had been his intention to invest a significant portion of his fortune into the renovations. Something about the Moors speak to me, he continued. Some find it lonely up here, but not I. The view on a summer's day is second to none. You can see the heart of England in all of her glory, and who wouldn't want to see that when they wake? Yes, this was to be a great house, only for that cursed lake and the refusal of folk to work here. He explained that his plans to drain the lake had met with fierce opposition from the nearby village of Leek. Labor had been hard to acquire and renovations had progressed slowly. They had halted altogether several weeks previously. I'll tell you what they said to me, those from the town. You can decide yourself whether there is any truth in their words. It was 1752 and the crew of the fishing ship St. George's Peril cast their nets into the Mediterranean Sea. They were fishing the Strait of Sicily in the hope of landing one final catch before they returned to Portsmouth. Upon hauling their nets on deck, they discovered something most unusual. Caught in the tangles of a net layer creature that was half woman, half fish, the crew christened her a mermaid. With flowing fair hair that settled upon her slender shoulders and tight curls and skin of pure white, she was quite the most beautiful thing the crew had ever seen. They elected to keep her on board with the intention of revealing her to an adoring British public upon their return. They all agreed that there was more money to be made by showing off their latest catch than by returning to fish the seas. One amongst the crew, a young sailor by the name of Benjamin Gosling, took a particular liking to the creature. He spent many hours in her company, and it was said that the two of them fell in love. As the days passed, the mermaid's health began to deteriorate. Little did the crew realize that because they had taken her from the water, she was slowly starting to die. She spoke of her desire to feed to Benjamin, who, blinded by his love for her, agreed to help satiate her hunger. One by one, Benjamin led the sailors to the mermaid with the promise that she intended to lie with them, and one by one, she feasted upon them leaving nothing remaining but offal and bone. As the crew dwindled and the journey home lengthened, the remaining men, suspicious of the disappearance of their shipmates, refused Benjamin's offer to meet the creature to mate. Their fear of the mermaid was high. With his love in danger of dying, Benjamin was forced to release her from her captured state so that she might continue to feed. On the 18th of September, 1752, St. George's Peril ran aground near the village of Poulton. Not a soul was found on board alive. It is said that Benjamin carried his love from that wreck and sought out a lake in which the mermaid could dwell undisturbed. He came to this place, Blakemere, atop the moors, far from any place, and laid her into the lake. He promised her that he would return, yet having witnessed her murder and devour his crewmates, he realized that he had brought a monster to the shores of England, and he never went back. Some say that the diet of blood and flesh caused the mermaid to transform into something foul and hideous. Indeed, no sighting of her ever describes her appearance as beautiful, save for those in this story. Strandfold allowed his words to settle before continuing. It's like this, Mr. White. I need laborers to work on the house, and none will come. 
They are afraid of the lake and what resides within its waters. I'd managed to round up a few willing to work. Not enough, granted, but it was a start. They downed tools when she appeared to them to warn them of what would happen should they drain her lake. They won't come back. Not until this matter is taken care of. That is where you come in. I finished my stew in silence, pondering on the intricacies of the tale I had heard. Fanciful though it was, there was the possibility that the story contained some degree of truth. The history of this ship could be traced. Records detailing her voyages would easily be obtainable were there a need, yet I struggled to believe that even a man gripped by love would so willingly lead his shipmates to their death. Strandfold observed me in thought, keen to read any flicker of reaction to his words. After a time, he stood. I've heard her sing, you know. Quite beautiful. Quite haunting. If you find yourself awake at around the time of one, you may hear her song carry faintly through the gale. I offered him the idea that it might be the wind he had heard. Often it produces notes which might easily be mistaken for melody or indeed, on rare occasion, song. He merely smiled, shook my hand, and wished me a good night's rest. Morning and a stiff wind blew across the moors. I found I had to angle myself into it to make progress towards the shore of Blakemere Pool. Sudden gusts threatened to steal my balance and I cursed the elements. Though the views of the English countryside were at times breathtaking, this was a godforsaken and desolate place. The surface of Blakemere Pool lay before me, still and black. The smell of sulfur pervaded here. I took a handkerchief from my pocket and pressed it to my mouth. Thack stood away from the edge, content to observe from a distance. I sank to my knees and trailed my hand through the water. The ripples caused by my movements spread quickly across the pool. Cold, ain't it? offered Thack. I nodded and returned a glove to my hand. Water's no good for drinking, like I said. Full of heat and clay deposits. And more. I turned and nodded in agreement. Thack handed me the large net that he had carried from the house. You'll be needing this too, said Thack as he turned and began to make his way back towards the house. Reckon you'll know what to do come the time. My initial circumnavigation of the pool revealed little of interest. Around, I estimated it to measure approximately 1,200 feet. In diameter, 80 feet at its widest point. I located the ditch that had been dug to drain the pool, concluding that it was a little shallow for purpose. However, the depth of the ditch would not have halted the process of lowering the level of the lake. Not if the workers had spent as many hours laboring as I had been informed. Was it possible that this lake was connected to Doxley Pool via an underground passage? I turned towards the horizon to my right and shielded my eyes against the glare of the low autumn sun. The other lake was barely visible, but I could not in all confidence rule out such a theory. I knew little of nature and her ways, so I could not rule out the possibility. I found no evidence of the presence of a mermaid, though I will admit to not knowing exactly what I should look for. There was no activity at all to be noted in or around the area of the pool. What birds I did observe stayed clear of both the lake and me. Night fell upon the moors and with it a further chill. I was to remain lakeside for the duration of the evening in the hope that I may catch the movement of something within the waters. Under the glare of the moon, Blakemere resembled a vast pool of blood, still and black. The hours rolled by and I began to numb in body and mind as the cold of the night seeped into my core. I had slept. For how long I was unsure, yet I woke with a start. The wind had ceased at the very same instant, I swear it, and an eerie calm settled over the lake. Faintly, almost unrecognizable at first, so softly did it come, I began to make out the sounds of a harmony, though what produced her notes I could not say. It was most unlike any instrument I had ever heard previously, more akin to the sound a cricket makes when attracting a mate. Yet this was not one fixed note, but many unannouncing together in a succession of various timings. This was music. 
The resultant symphony carried my mind to a far-off place and momentarily I left the moors and their desolation far behind. The sound of water being disturbed brought me back to my senses. With the ethereal melody suddenly lost in the fog of my mind, my eyes fixated on the ripples that had emanated from the center of the pond. I climbed to my feet with the net in hand. My heart pounded for I was as sure as that that nothing could reside within these troubled waters. The sound of movement came again, nearer to shore, nearer to me. The creature broke the surface of the water not ten yards from my position. It rose to a height of three feet, its yellow eyes glinting in the moonlight. This was not a creature of beauty. Her hair, for I determined it to be female, hung in thick tangles of black. Her face was drawn and skeletal, her nose pinched and pointed. Her flesh emitted a green tinge that gave the creature a glowing aura. She smiled and revealed a mouth lined with many needle-like teeth. For a moment, we each regarded the other. Silently, she began to glide towards me, the water parting in her wake. Frozen by fear, I allowed her to reach the shore. She was now within mere feet of me. With a smooth motion, I brought the net down upon her and attempted to pin her to the ground. She began to thrash and struggle to break free. I must confess I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do with the mermaid now that she was within my control, other than hang on until morning in the hope of further help. She managed to back into the water. The power of the creature was remarkable. I was dragged helplessly towards the water's edge until she dived below the surface. I allowed the net to travel with her, but she began to push harder against my grasp. I elected to drag her back to the surface, where I had concluded she was slightly more manageable, but I struggled to do so. As she broke water, the creature uttered a shrill shriek that threatened to pierce my eardrums, and instinct forced my hands to my ears. The net fell to the ground and the mermaid swam free. I sank to my knees and examined my hands. They had come away from my ears bloody. I could feel the sound of my heartbeat and little else. Somewhere out of sight, I heard the mermaid break the surface of the water again, followed by a playful giggle. The rest of my vigil passed without incident. Thack and Strandfold were only too eager to hear my tale. I delivered a clear description of the creature and recounted my struggle. I advised that, in my opinion, it would be difficult to try to remove the mermaid from the pool, possibly even dangerous. I had experienced her might firsthand and warned that if her origin story were true, it may well be better to leave her be. Strandfold seemed amused at my story. In his eyes, I had come to him as the doubter, the fool in the room. I allowed him his moment of satisfaction. After all, it is not often that a story so outlandish is proven true. I bid them both well in the hope that my advice was to be followed. Blakemere was home to a creature no longer of myth, but fact. Excited by this prospect though we were, we decided between us that the Blakemere mermaid would be better left undisturbed. When I came to compile this book, I attempted to make contact with Strandfold to inquire as to the well-being of his aquatic guest. I received no reply. Contacting Thack, I was later informed that Strandfold had been found floating in Blakemere Pool some several years previous. It is said that his body was marked with deep lacerations and that his eyes were plucked from his head. Blakemere House was left to ruin. Today only the lake and its guest remain. I often wonder what possessed Strandfold to seek her out. Perhaps it was her song that beckoned him to his death. Alas... I shall never know for sure. The Interment of the Safe The Road to Dartmoor, 1876 Recalling the account of the Blakemere Mermaid has stirred another memory, though this incident occurred several years later. I warn that this may well be the case, but please forgive me. I wish to recount this particular tale while it is fresh in my mind. The year was 1876. I was now held in a position of high regard in terms of my research. I had five years' experience working within the realms of the paranormal. Such was the all-encompassing term coined to describe the nature of my work, and I had proven almost as many cases to be hoaxes as to be true. 
It was the height of summer when I was called to Devon, specifically Dartmoor, with regard to a tale that I shall touch upon in due course. As was customary, a coach was sent so that I may be afforded the luxury of direct travel. However, it was necessary for the driver to collect several fares along my journey, for though my road was long and the pay good, this was a man with many mouths to feed, and it made perfect sense to collect passengers along the route who could further add to his purse. I minded little. As I had become accustomed to my work, I had realized the importance of observing witnesses during their testimonies. A great deal of truth can be learned not by listening to what is said, but by observing the language of the body. This interest passed into my leisure time when I would often find myself watching the actions of those around me. Traveling in the company of strangers allowed me to hone my abilities further. I recall one such gentleman, for quite the character was he. It was the village of Yarnfield where our paths crossed. Upon the morning of our departure, I was greeted by the sight of my driver and a tall gangly fellow struggling to load what appeared to be a large item of furniture onto the back of the coach. After much huffing and puffing with little headway made, the driver called for my assistance. No stranger to lending a hand, I immediately obliged and between the three of us, we were able to manhandle the load into position. The piece was rectangular in shape, wrapped in several layers of dark material, standing at a height of approximately four feet and weighing more than I would hasten to guess. Indeed, the three of us had struggled to move it. While lifting the load, it had been apparent that there was something large and cumbersome inside the mysterious object, for each of us had felt the shift of weight as we struggled to maneuver the heavily wrapped piece into position. When the driver, breathless and red with exertion, asked as to what we were loading onto his carriage, the tall man elected not to speak. Once it was safely stowed, it was noted that the extra weight had caused the rear of the wagon to sink. It now sat mere inches from the ground. The driver took the tall fellow aside and remarked that to carry the load as far as Devon, an extra horse would need to be added to share the workload. The tall man nodded. The driver continued to explain that our departure would be delayed while alterations were carried out to reinforce the rear of the carriage. The tall man nodded again. Bemused, the driver informed him that this would add to the price of his passage. The tall man reached into his pocket and handed the driver a handful of coins. Later that afternoon, we departed Yarnfield to continue our journey south, the bulk of which passed in silence. This bothered me little as I made my notes to occupy my thoughts. I was never much of a conversationalist back in those early days. I preferred to keep my business my own and I found pleasantries hard to pass off convincingly. I need not have worried, as my traveling companion kept his attention focused on the passing scenery. Whenever there was a sudden bump in the road, of which there were many, I noted that my companion would shift in his seat and his attention would move to his parcel, which was stowed behind his seating on the rear of the coach. With a strained look, it seemed as though he would hold his breath a moment until finally satisfied he would return to a relaxed poise and continue to stare out beyond the window. There were times, too, when I thought I heard sounds coming from the parcel on the back of the coach. How best to describe them? Perhaps the sounds of something moving around awkwardly inside? My companion noticed my alarm and eyed me with a nervousness which unsettled me deeply. Recognizing his anxiety, I hastily concluded that the sounds were caused by the shifting of cargo due to the conditions of the road, and I continued with my notes. My companion's eyes lingered upon me a moment longer scrutinizing me as I worked until he returned them to the window once more. We were to bed in Bristol before continuing on into Dartmoor on the morrow. The exact destination of my traveling companion was a mystery both to myself and to our driver. When pressed, he would mumble to keep heading west and would offer no more. With much of an audience, the three of us unloaded the coach and carried the mystery item through a crowded tavern up a small flight of stairs and into the room the tall man would occupy that evening. He muttered not one word of thanks. Fatigued from our exertions, the driver and I retired to the busy tavern and sat for our evening meal. It was a lively place, frequented by sailors, dockers, and soldiers alike. We stayed a while and listened to the chatter. 
Experience had shown that taverns often proved to be a fruitful source of myth and folklore. The hour was late when I ascended the staircase that led to my lodgings at the rear of the tavern. My driver had bid me good night an hour or so earlier, and I had elected to remain behind to see if any of the assorted drinkers had heard the tale which I was traveling to investigate. Neither of us had seen any sign of our traveling companion. As I moved to pass the door to the tall man's room, I paused for a moment. Raised voices could be heard coming from inside, though they were muffled by the closed door. Curious, I pressed my ear to it. I was mistaken. There was only one voice which was raised, a voice I attributed to the tall man. He appeared to be distressed, though I could not fathom why as I was only able to hear his somber replies. The voice of the other partaker in this conversation was but a low murmur to me. There came a sudden scream and instinctively I pushed the door aside, entering the tall man's room. I meant to aid, not pry, for the scream was one of horror and dread. I saw before me a blur of movement and a tangle of elongated gray limbs, which disappeared into the object that the three of us had struggled to carry to this room, slamming the object's heavy door shut behind it. The tall man and I regarded one another for a moment. What, what did you see? He asked, his tone uneven, his body shaking. By light, I could see that the item was a safe, cast in iron. The material in which it had been previously wrapped was folded neatly on the bed. The tall man looked at me, his eyes bloodshot and wide in surprise, likely at my sudden intrusion. After taking a moment to assess the scene, I ventured an answer. I told him that I saw a large safe cast of iron. I told him that I understood now why we had struggled to lift it. And, pressed the tall man, his eyes darting first to the safe and then back to me. I hesitated, unsure of how to answer. The tall man sat on the edge of the bed and began to sob. It is a terrible thing that you saw, something no man should ever cast eyes upon. It, she moves. Yes, but she is not alive. At least not in any sense that is Christian. I asked the man to explain further, but he declined. The creature I had momentarily observed had appeared in no way to be human. Short and stocky with no clear sign of a head, its skin was a gray tone and its arms lolled and trailed behind its torso. I asked if I may open the safe to cast eyes upon the creature again, but the tall man erupted into a rage so unlike his previous nature that I fled the room amidst threats to my safety, should I ever breathe a word to anyone of what had transpired that night. The next morning, the three of us loaded the safe, which was freshly bound and hidden from view again, onto the back of the carriage. The tall man's eyes teased at threats of violence, and I chose to devote my attention to my notes. Privately, I wondered as to the contents of the safe. What manner of being had I observed the night before? Having interrupted their discussion, I had noted a look of sheer terror on the tall man's face. Why was he so afraid of the thing in the safe? These questions and more troubled me, and what had started out as an everyday journey had suddenly become one of serious interest to me and my work. Again, the ride was rough and uncompromising. The sounds of movement continued to emanate from the safe. Though it was never acknowledged aloud, those of us traveling in the carriage knew that not all of the sounds coming from the back were due to the conditions of the road. It was in a village named Colleton that the tall man instructed the driver to halt, specifically at the gates of St. Andrew's Parish Church. He told us that we must remain stationary until nightfall, and while our driver bemoaned this instruction, Having seen the desperate and wild side of the man, I elected to hold my tongue. Our companion reiterated that the driver was to be well compensated for his time, and I was content to observe what might happen after dark. I felt that this journey, and indeed this story, were fast approaching their conclusion. The hush of darkness fell upon Colleton. Cottage doors were locked in the winding cobbled streets emptied of life. Satisfied that all eyes were behind closed doors, the tall man gestured for us to alight. The gates of the cemetery were secured with a chain. The tall man took a long metal pole he had stowed in the back of the carriage and used it to break the links of the chain, allowing us access. 
The graveyard was small and well kept, yet in the blackness of the night, there lurked an oppressive atmosphere. I felt that after dusk, the living, having brought offerings of flowers and paid tearful respects to the deceased, were no longer welcome in this place of rest. The driver and I waited by the side of the carriage, content to leave the tall man to his trespass. He disappeared from sight for several moments before returning to us, a shovel in each hand. Come, he instructed. We dig. Despite our silent protestations, we followed the tall man to an area of the cemetery which afforded us seclusion due to the presence of a large tree. I could see the discord on my driver's face as the three of us set about our task. Though he seemed reluctant in his efforts, I concluded that he was content enough to oblige his passenger's wish given the promise of further payment. You may ask why I partook in this grueling effort. Ordinarily, I would have forcefully declined such an instruction, opting to stay in the relative comfort of the coach and as far from the muck and exertion that grave digging entails as possible. As it was, we knew we were digging a grave for something, and though my driver was motivated by coin and had little interest in the hows and whys of the task, I was driven by the most insistent of emotions, curiosity. We worked through the bulk of the night. It was not a traditional grave that the tall man ordered us to dig, more a square shaft running to a depth of approximately 10 feet. Satisfied with our efforts, the tall man afforded us a short break before ordering us to remove the safe from the back of the carriage. Again, aside from managing the bulk of the safe, all was well until we passed through the gates of the cemetery. Were it not for our combined efforts, the safe would inevitably have spilled from our hands, such was the force of the sudden movement felt from within. The weight shifted violently from my left to my right, though the three of us managed to catch the tumbling safe with bare inches to spare. The look of horror upon our driver's face as he realized that the item he was carrying contained something alive showed pure shock. His hesitation only added to our struggle in keeping the safe aloft. Breathless, we continued towards the freshly dug shaft. As we drew near, the amount of movement coming from inside the safe increased in ferocity, and it was soon accompanied by a muted wail the likes of which no human could muster. This activity continued to intensify with each step taken, testing our resolve. As we approached the lip of the shaft, the tall man ordered us to set the safe onto the ground. By now, the activity coming from inside had reached feverish heights, and I was confident that the shrieks emanating from within would alert those in the cottages neighboring the cemetery. The tall man urged us to ignore the terrible cries, and together we pushed the safe closer and closer to the edge. With one final effort, we tumbled the safe into the hole, though it fell at an awkward angle and lodged halfway. Cursing in a foreign tongue, the tall man leapt in and proceeded to jump on it, forcing the safe deeper into the shaft. My driver and I watched in disbelief as the tall man sank further in with every leap until he disappeared from sight entirely. After a few short moments, he called to us for help, and together we lifted him from the hole. Knowing what must follow, we each took to our shovels and began loading soil back into the earth whence it had come. With each handful of dirt replaced, the screaming and the thrashing emanating from inside the safe diminished until finally they subsided altogether. The tall man did not continue his journey west, electing to remain in Colleton to catch a coach heading to London. The driver assured me that he had been well paid for both his silence and his efforts. As for myself, the tall man did offer coin in order that I ask no questions nor tell of our activities that night, but I politely declined his offer. Though I often wonder what manner of creature we consigned to the hallowed earth that night, I can only assume that the tall man's motives were born of necessity and not desire. As far as I am aware, she resides there still. The Screaming Skull Burton Agnes, Yorkshire, February 1872 My third investigation... To this day, I do not count my time in Elverton as anything other than a failed exercise, came by way of an invite to Burton Agnes Hall. This particular manor house had occupied the same site since the days of the Norman Conquest, changing hands over the centuries not by means of sale, but by family lineage. 
I was instructed to pack for a short stay and informed that I would be briefed as to my duties in person by the lord of the manor. There was little in the way of further information. Located in Burton, Agnes, Yorkshire, the manor house was an impressive example of Norman construction, though I must admit that its subsequent history was of far more interest to me. It seemed that my reputation as an investigator of note had spread further afield than I had dared imagine, having caught the attention of Lord Foxby, and I was only too eager to begin my work anew. Upon my arrival, my belongings were taken to my room and I was ushered into the study, whereupon I was introduced to Lord Foxby. He was a fellow of similar age to myself, and as I listened, I judged him to be well-read and of high intellect. We drank excellent port and discussed my previous investigations, satisfied that there was nothing in his demeanor which would suggest an air of the fantastical. I accepted his invitation to remain as his guest and to investigate the claims of which he spoke at length. Indeed, a crucial part of my investigation focused on the credibility of key witnesses, and this was a skill that I would be able to hone further over the countless cases yet to come. Presented here, in words told to me by Lord Foxby himself, is the plight of Burton Agnes Hall. You may well know that the Hall and its many treasures have passed through the ownership of many generations, yet not one single penny has ever changed hands to procure her ownership. It is blood that inherits the manor, not wealth nor influence, and it is said that many links have been taken to keep it so. In 1643, the manor and its land were owned by Lady Anna Farlish. History tells us that her husband, Lord Timothy Farlish, was a most unpleasant sort. A latch and a drunk, it is said, he indulged in many extramarital affairs, yet his wife stood resolutely by his side. One such affair involved Lady Farlish's sister, Margaret Ansey. She was the younger of the two, and it is said that Lord Farlish had lusted after her for many a year. Margaret fell pregnant by Lord Farlish, who at this time had no immediate heir. With no plans to divorce Anna, for she held the rights to the estate, it is said he attacked Margaret as she guested in the East Wing, stabbing her with a pocket knife in a desperate attempt to rid her of child. Sadly, Margaret succumbed to her injuries and died that very night. With her dying breath, she cursed Lord Farlish for his deeds, citing that she belonged in the manor house with her family, and should her head not remain perched atop the mantelpiece until the manor did crumble, then each who resided within would suffer terribly. The murder of Margaret Ansey was attributed to one of the servant boys and the claim put about that having been spurned in his efforts to woo her, he had attacked her out of fury. He was hanged from a tree in the grounds at the very same time that Margaret was interred in the Ansey family crypt in Burton Agnes Cemetery, which lay on the opposite side of the village. That night, the house was beset by all manner of tears, so much so that the body of Margaret was ordered exhumed the next morning and her head removed and brought back to the manor. It was at this point that my host stood and bid me follow him. I asked what specific terror had befallen the house that night, but he did not answer. We left the study and followed a narrow oak-paneled corridor as it weaved its way through the bowels of the house. After passing several rooms, Lord Foxby stopped before a set of grand double doors. He searched his pockets for a moment and produced a small key. He paused for breath after turning the key and spoke to me, his eye fixed upon the keyhole. I shall warn you, no person has set foot in this room in almost a decade. I cannot prepare you for what you may experience in this place. Know that you look upon Margaret of your own will. Yes, I nodded and assured him that I wished to continue. The door eased open with a groan and we stepped inside. Lord Foxby threw aside a pair of heavy drapes thick with dust and the mid-afternoon sun flooded into the room. I moved deeper inside as my host busied himself with the second set of drapes. The vast chamber would have served as a dining room at one time, such was its size, shape, and location. Though now devoid of all furniture, the air rang with the memories of countless engagements past. 
Lord Foxby began to speak. There, he pointed, covering his mouth with a handkerchief. The mantelpiece. I turned in the direction Lord Foxby had indicated and saw something he sat in the center of the mantelpiece. With a nod, Lord Foxby gave permission for me to proceed and I approached. The object was covered with a black silken cloth, which, despite the environment, was utterly devoid of dust. My hand hovered tentatively above it. I knew that beneath this lay the head of Margaret Ancy, and I required a moment to compose myself before unveiling her. With a quick motion, I removed the silken cloth and stared at the sight before me. The skull was tinged with patches of black and gray. The lower jawbone was cracked and several of her teeth were absent. Though long dead, the gaze of Margaret Ancy seemed to mock my repulsion. I staggered backward, dropping the cloth onto the floor, feeling nauseous and dizzy. You are not the first to react so poorly to a permanent guest, remarked Lord Foxby. Tell me, do you feel unwell? I assured him that whatever sickness had taken upon me had quickly subsided. For several feet away from her, I felt immediately better. I concluded that now was not the time to show distaste, not in front of the man who tasked me with dispelling her myth. I stared at the skull, and the skull stared back. Lord Foxby replaced the cloth over the skull, breaking my concentration. Come, friend, he said. Let us to your chambers. There shall be plenty of time for you two to become acquainted over the next couple of days. Much to my surprise, I slept soundly that first night. Any thoughts of the rotted skull of Margaret Ancy remained far from my mind. It was at breakfast I first encountered Lady Jasmine Foxby. Boiled egg and freshly baked bread in hand, I had seated myself at the foot of the table. Lord Foxby, having sent his apologies, was conspicuous by his absence, meaning that the table was shared by only Lady Foxby and me. We engaged in pleasantries and light conversation while the servants busied themselves, and I remember feeling at ease in her company. I guessed her to be a shade younger than myself. She was of similar height and a slender build, and had long dark hair that lay unnaturally straight. Her face held quite the softest features I had ever set eyes upon, and she spoke with intelligence and enthusiasm. Her eyes sparkled with a mischievous nature, and she wielded with ease the sharpest of wit. It would be safe to say that I was enchanted by her presence, and I allowed myself to linger at the breakfast table a while longer than I had initially planned. She took a keen interest in my ideas regarding the paranormal and reveled in hearing tales of my work. She had several keen theories of her own, though lamented that she had few around her with whom to share her interest. Even her husband forbade her from conducting an investigation into the skull of Margaret Ancy, a practice which I assured her was most unfair. Time slipped quickly by that morning. All too soon was she called away to carry out the duties required of the lady of the manor and I was left with lingering feeling that she and I had experienced a unique connection. It was decided by Lord Foxby that on the second evening of my stay I would remain alone in the Great Hall, with naught but the remains of Lady Margaret Ancy, the means to record any observations I might make, and a solitary candle. Were it not for the kindness of Lady Foxby, who in the dead of night sought my company and delivered a thick woolen blanket, I wager that I would have perished, it being so cold. The lady stayed but a few moments, curious as to my findings, before returning to her chambers. What little warmth the blanket afforded seemed to dissipate upon her departure. Aside from a ferocious wind which seemed to pound the outer walls for the majority of the night, there was little out of the ordinary to note. I spent a good part of the third day sleeping in the guest quarters, having been granted so little reprieve by the uncompromising weather the night before. I knew that tonight would be where the real crux of my investigative work would begin, for Lord Foxby had ordered one of the kitchen staff to remove the skull from the mantel and to deposit it somewhere within the gardens. The exact location of Lady Ancy's skull was known only to the Lord and the poor wretch ordered to hide her. It was not long after dusk when the disturbances began. 
Again, I was settled in the great hall, my notes at my side, and the thick woolen blanket gifted from Lady Foxby laid across my lap. At first, the sounds consisted of a series of sharp raps that seemed to emanate from within the area occupied by the fireplace. They would cease whenever I ventured close, so it was impossible for me to identify the exact location of their origin. This game of back and forth continued until approximately one o'clock. After a brief hiatus, the sound of slamming doors echoed throughout the manor house, followed hastily by heavy footfalls that seemed to walk in several parts of the house at once. Lord Foxby had instructed that all serving staff remain in their chambers after dark and promised that he and Lady Foxby would do likewise. Several times did I venture from that room, convinced that I would successfully identify the person whose footsteps at times shook the very fabric of the house. Not once did I observe anyone walking the halls, despite a thorough search. The footfalls continued, gaining in volume. On occasion, they seemed to occur in my immediate vicinity and to my ears appeared to be heading straight towards me. Again, I saw nothing of their origin, even when they sounded so close to my person. It was the wailing which finally prompted me to knock upon the chambers of Lord and Lady Foxby. The house was alive with the sounds of the damned and I was at a loss as to their source. What began as a resonant moan, which one could easily mistake as the sound of the wind billowing over the tops of the chimney pots, soon developed into a chorus of screams and lamentations the likes of which would unnerve even the hardiest soul. Lord Foxby answered my furtive knocking, his face ashen with terror. I have heard naught as harrowing as the wails that have shaken these walls this night, he began. Come, we must return Margaret to her resting place above the mantel. I agreed, for whatever manner of horror afflicted us showed no sign of waning. The two of us hurried through the darkened corridors of Burton Agnes Hall, beset on all sides by ferocious rappings, the crashing of doors, and a cacophony of anguished cries. Leaving the hall, it was a relief to be outside, free from the somber mood that had befallen the manor house with the advent of darkness, if only temporarily. The shrieks and crashes that gripped the house could still be heard as we made our way deep into the gardens, and my thoughts turned to those still in the house, those who must have been cowering in their beds, afraid to peek out from beneath their blankets. Lord Foxby led me first into a barn, then to an upturned bucket. Here, he said, lifting the tin pail. Take her back inside. Only, nothing lay beneath. Curses flowed from his lips as he searched the barn. Damn it, boy, you said you had placed her beneath an upturned pail. Yet she is not here? Will this madness continue until it drives us from our home? I joined the search, remarking that it might be possible another bucket was the hiding place of Margaret's skull. After a further ten minutes of searching, Lord Foxby cried out, Success! Come, let us return. Jasmine shall be at her wit's end, no doubt. As we carried the skull of Margaret back inside, an instant hush settled upon the manor. Lord Foxby and I stood a moment, unnerved by the sudden calm. Moments before, chaos had raged within these walls. Now all was still. Lord Foxby made his way towards the Great Hall and I followed, eager to see Margaret return to her rightful place, grateful that we might be able to save her a moment's peace before dawn. With shaking limbs, Lord Foxby placed her skull onto the center of the mantelpiece, back in the position where she had long held court. What followed was a curious feeling. The mood lightened the moment she touched the wood of the mantel. It was then that I noticed the first rays of sunlight piercing the ill-fitting drapes and heard with a sense of welcome relief the opening notes of the dawn chorus. The night's events were discussed at length during breakfast, which was taken later than usual due to the disturbed night that all occupants of the house had suffered. Lord Foxby appeared the more shaken of our number. I assumed he felt an air of blame in regard to our torment, as it was he who had arranged for this experiment to be carried out. Both Lady Foxby, who seemed utterly fascinated with the night's events, and I explained that he need not feel he ought to take any form of accountability. I concluded that despite my best efforts, I could find no rational explanation for what we had endured during the night. 
Though at first I had been confident that I could at the very least attribute the heavy footfalls to a person or persons actively wandering the house, this was not the case. Throughout my searches at the height of the disturbances, I had failed to apprehend anybody. Again, with regard to the wailing, which I had initially attributed to the wind, I concluded that this was not its origin, given the variety, volume, location, and content of sounds heard. There had been a human element behind the majority of the sounds. Genuine emotion, that of anger and torment, had carried through the halls. Occasional words have been heard such as lament, love, return, and family. These I could not satisfactorily explain away. Nor the rapping and the slamming of doors, for frequently they had occurred in several locations at once. I was confident that should hoaxers have been at large within the manor, I would have caught sight of them at some point during the night. I advised that for the time being, in order to keep an air of calm in the hall, the skull of Margaret Ancy remain on the mantelpiece. That was not the last I saw of Lady Jasmine Foxby. Little did I foresee the profound influence that she would have upon me. Alas, those are tales for another time. In our first correspondence, of which there were many, she informed me that her husband had taken to excavating a nook behind the top of the mantelpiece in which the skull was soon interred. The remains of Margaret reside there still. There have been no further reports of disturbances occurring in or around the manor house to date. Hope you enjoyed tonight's tales, The Tainted Isle featuring The Black Lake, The Interment of the Safe, and The Screaming Skull by Dan Weatherer. Award-winning author Dan Weatherer was first published by Haunted Magazine in spring 2013. Aside from the publication of numerous short stories with a multitude of presses, his next major project was a solo collection of short stories titled The Soul That Screamed winner of the Predators and Editors Reader's Poll Best Anthology 2013. An accomplished playwright, Dan was the winner of the 2017 Soundwork UK Play Competition, a finalist in the Blackshaw Showcase Award 2016, and a two-time finalist of the Congleton Players One Act Festival 2016. Dan has had several of his plays appear at festivals and fringe events. The Dead Stage, a book detailing Dan's experiences as a novice playwright was published courtesy of Crystal Lake Publishing in October 2018. In 2019, Dan was nominated for a local Heroes Award, The Sentinel, for his continued promotion of literacy and mental health issues in the city of Stoke-on-Trent. In 2020, Dan became a contributor for Creepypasta Stories and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, 2020 also saw the release of his novella, Cheslin Meyer, Domain Publishing. Presently, Dan contributes to the YouTube channel Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and his stage plays continue to be sold and performed worldwide. Check out Dan's website at www.danweatherer.co.uk. That's D A N W E A T H E R E R. Dot co dot uk If you enjoyed tonight's story hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S.net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode. 
and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens. So if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd really appreciate it. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.